Good morning, OpenStack community. Thank you very much for traveling all the way to the fine city of Atlanta to be with us this morning. To kick things off today, please welcome Jonathan Bryce. Good morning, everyone. Thank you for uh, joining us here in Atlanta for the OpenStack Summit. It's May 2014. It's, uh, it's quite a crowd we have here. <laughs> this is very exciting. Um, you know, we are here in Atlanta, and uh, we have about 4,500 of you who are going to be joining us this week. So by far the largest OpenStack Summit yet. Um, we work with a production crew to put these shows together, and they started working with us a year and a half ago. And at, the, at that event, we had 1,200 people in San Diego. So in, in 18 months, you know, from 1,200 to 4,500, quite, uh, quite a jump, um, you know, bigger audience. They've, they've got me hooked up with two mic packs now for some reason. But <laughs> so um, you know, we're here in Atlanta, and uh, I actually used to live in Atlanta. I was thinking about this when, uh, when I got into town. I, uh, I lived here about 19 years ago, and this was actually the, uh, the place where I, I did my first professional software development work. <laughs> it was, uh, I, was, I was young and, uh, and dumb, and I didn't charge enough money. But you know, it was, it was the mid-'90s, and the internet was just getting started, and it was really exciting. And so you know, now here we are, back with, uh, with a whole crew of, uh, of OpenStack developers, operators, um, new users, potential users. It's really exciting. And, and our events are, are really fantastic because of the, the makeup that we have of who's here. Um, we have a lot of great companies who sponsor the show and allow us to, uh, to be able to do this and put it on. Um, so you know, we have over 90 companies who are sponsoring um, this, this summit this week. So thank you to all of our sponsor companies. And I, I want to call out specifically VMware, who sponsored our OpenStack travel program. This is a new initiative that we, uh, that we started six months ago. And, uh, and we are continuing that, thanks to, uh, again, the strong support of, of some of our ecosystem companies. This is a program that allows us to fund travel for OpenStack community members who may not be able to make it to these events themselves on their own dime. And it's really important for us to make sure that if you contribute, if you participate, if you are part of the community and adding value to OpenStack, that, uh, that we find ways to, uh, to allow those people to be able to be here during these summits. So thank you, VMware, for sponsoring our OpenStack travel program this time around. A couple housekeeping items. You uh, should have a badge. If you were not able to get a badge before we started and you jumped the rope line and ran down the stairs, please go back and get one later. You'll need it this week. Um, the badge has, uh, obviously, your, your info on it. On the back, a lot of information that you might need to connect to Wi-Fi, um, when the schedule of events is. This actually pulls out and, and unfolds and uh, has maps and all sorts of things. So useful information in your, uh, in your badge here. And just to uh, talk a little bit about where things are, we are on the ground floor level here. And uh, we have several floors of content. It's a big space. There are maps. Um, we have staff around. Ask for directions if you need help. But I think um, you know, you'll find that, uh, that the, uh, the layout is pretty simple once you, once you get your head wrapped around it. We have a new mobile app. If you go to openstack.org slash summit slash mobile, you can find our guidebook mobile app that has maps and schedules and uh, a lot of information in there that, um, that will help you navigate your way around. And there's a web version as well. Something else that's happening this week that's exciting is um, our summit is really multiple events in one. We have conference sessions that talk about different technologies, different use cases, um, strategy, business concerns. We have the Design Summit, which is a, a really key part of this event. For those of you who are here for the first time, the Design Summit is a collection of working sessions where the developers get together, they discuss um, project issues, software issues, they plan out 
the roadmap and prioritize the work for the next six months for, for the next release. And, um, and those design summit sessions are really meant to be productive working um, events. If you want to go attend and participate, you're certainly welcome to do that. But please keep in mind that uh, you know, this is critical time for our development teams to, um, to focus on the work that they need to do to you know, keep making OpenStack great. The other thing that's happening this afternoon and on Friday is an ops meetup. And these are similar sessions to those design summit sessions. They are working sessions for operators who are running OpenStack, making use of OpenStack, so they can get together, share best practices, talk about how they are dealing with the different um, deployment models and the different things that they need to do to make their businesses successful with OpenStack. And that's new this time around. So if you are an OpenStack operator, um, please participate in that and give us feedback on it. We want to make sure that, uh, that you're getting value out of that. Uh, I was looking through some of the registration numbers, and I think we have somewhere around 600 or so operators here at this event. So that's you know, a, a really good turnout, and, uh, and hopefully we can, we can serve you better this time around with some, uh, some good content. We just had our Icehouse software release, and uh, it was uh, our you know, really great software release. It was very much focused on operational issues, um, kind of maturing the software, maturing the processes around how it gets developed and tested. And uh, it was really exciting to, to have uh, Icehouse come out a, a few weeks ago. Tomorrow morning, Mark Collier is going to talk a little bit about some of what's in Icehouse and uh, some of the technical details around it. But I wanted to actually um, focus a little bit on, on the people who built Icehouse. And uh, there was some activity on Twitter last week, and some people were saying that we should have uh, contributors come up on stage for Icehouse. I think we might have too many of you to get you on and off stage in a timely fashion. But I do want to ask, if you made your first contribution to OpenStack in the Icehouse release cycle, could you please stand? <laughs> this is really exciting. You, stay standing, actually. So the contribution process in OpenStack is actually something that is, is really excellent. Um, code comes in, it gets reviewed, it gets tested, it goes through this process. Just as important as those incoming contributions are the reviewers and the process for checking that code as it, as it comes into our source trees. So if you are a first-time reviewer in Icehouse, please stand as well. Yes, so thank you. Now, not as many first-time reviewers. We need, we need more people getting in and pitching in on the reviews. So that could be a goal. You know, if, you are, uh, if you're a contributor to, uh, to OpenStack and are looking to take the next step, um, you know, maybe in the Juno cycle, you can pitch in and, and start helping with, with, with code reviews. And finally, just anybody who, who got a contribution in Icehouse, please stand. Wow. Thank you, guys. This is part of what makes this event different. You know, this is, this is an event where the practitioners and the software developers are here together to make OpenStack better. And, uh, and so thank you guys very much for your work in Icehouse. Um, that was only about half of the people who contributed in Icehouse. <laughs> so that, that's your software development team, OpenStack. So thank you guys very much. Talking a lot about Icehouse there. Icehouse is software. And uh, OpenStack is software. But I wanted to uh, talk a little bit about some larger concepts today and uh, a little bit about how key software really is in our world. You know, software has completely changed the way that we communicate, that we make decisions, that we iterate. Even the way we build physical things is different now than it was a few decades ago. And it has changed not just how we work, but it changes what we work on. It changes the cost of working on those things. And it allows us to do new things that we haven't been able to do before. I was talking about the contribution process for OpenStack. The contribution process for OpenStack is software. It, it's a, a number of open source systems that our core infrastructure team has integrated, um, expanded on, created new tools, and it allows us to take in contributions from thousands of developers 
all over the world to test them, to review them, to maintain a high level of code quality as all of that comes in, and to keep on hitting our release dates and bringing new features in. And it's, it's very powerful when you think about that process. It's an incredible collaborative global process that's really made possible by software. And I was thinking about, you know, imagine if we were in a pre-software era. How would that work? You know, let's say that uh, we're in the 1800s. And, uh, you know, this is just for, for hypotheticals. We, uh, we need to do a code review in the 1800s. So you sit down, you're a developer, and, uh, you know, perhaps you are based in Asia. We have a lot of contributors in Asia. You take out your, your quill and your ink, and you uh, spend a couple hours, and you, you write out your, uh, your code submission. And then, you know, you, uh, you put it on a ship because it needs to be reviewed by a core reviewer in Georgia. So your two hours turns into two months and two hours. It gets to the West Coast. They put it on a train, heads across the country, stagecoach, makes its way to your reviewer. He looks at it, and uh, you had some trailing white space. <laughs> So months later, you know, you finally get the notification. And you just, you know, you think about the turnaround cycle on something that simple. I mean, that is, it's a little bit of a, of hyperbole perhaps. But, you know, that is really an incredible shift in how the world works today. And our code review system is, uh, is something that is, uh, that, that's really incredible. If you go to review.openstack.org, you can actually see how it works. It's real time, it's live. You can see code reviews coming through there. People are pushing changes up all the time, reviewing them, making comments, and, uh, and the whole cycle just turns so much faster. And that's a, you know, a very small example. But that's, that's the power of software, and I think you know, kind of a concrete way. And this is not something that you know, is, is brand new. People realize this. And if we think about the technology industry, what have we been hearing about? We've been hearing about software-defined net networking, software-defined storage. It's expanded to the software-defined data center. But I think that really, even that is kind of boxing it in too much. Because if you think about what all of this enables and where we're heading, we're really living in a software-defined economy. It touches every business, every industry. And in the software-defined economy, every company competes with a startup. The barrier to entry in every industry is dramatically lowered. And what this means is, you know, if you are a very large company, that isn't necessarily a benefit to you. That's not a competitive advantage. In fact, that can be a disadvantage. You know, if you are in the banking industry, you're having to compete with all kinds of technology companies now. Big media having to compete with all kinds of startups and technology companies. I think Netflix recently won an Emmy. I and mean, this is not just about delivering on-demand video. They are producing award-winning content. The automotive industry, you have Tesla. And you know, Elon Musk, I think, is, uh, is an amazing innovator. He is uh, not happy with just taking on the automotive industry. He is now taking on the Air Force. <laughs> Even the Air Force has to compete with startups. And it's because, again, back to this technology shift, if you, if you think about that first code review example, the expense and time and effort is extremely high. And when it's expensive to do that, it keeps experimentation, it keeps innovation low. When you can lower that expense, you can iterate so much more rapidly. And, and this is just, you know, it's kind of obvious, but when you can take a week and try something and find out if it works, you're much more likely to go out and make some bets and see how it works, see what works, what doesn't, than if it's going to take you a year to do that. What we're talking about is really increasing the velocity of money. So you know, software is key to that. This is a little snippet from, uh, from an OpenStack project. Can anyone recognize it? Swift, yes. It's, it's the container server. So software is really key to that. And uh, software is built by developers, we just saw a number of those who worked on the, uh, the ice house cycle. But 
it's not just about the software. You have to have an environment that can match the velocity of your software development to get that out in front of your users and your customers. This is just as important as the developers, as the software. You have to have the people and the systems that give them agile infrastructure. And if you have the software development practice and you have software developers who can turn out great code, but you don't have that agile infrastructure, it's kind of like having you know, a Formula One car, a high performance vehicle that doesn't have any wheels on it. It's an amazing piece of machinery, but it's not going anywhere. And so in the last five years, six years, we've seen a lot of growth in the agile infrastructure space. You know, this started, of course, with Amazon and uh, their web services offerings. They really, I think, have pioneered a lot of approaches that, uh, that, that people have adopted and seen great value come out of that. And in OpenStack, I think what's really incredible is we've gone from a model where, you know, six or seven years ago, basically the only place that you could get that kind of agile infrastructure was from Amazon or from um, you know, the, the services. OpenStack has opened that up and made that possible for so many more organizations. So many, many, many more organizations are able to take advantage of these capabilities. And for many of those organizations, OpenStack is the engine of the software-defined economy. At our uh, events, we, uh, we often have uh, users who come out and, and speak with us. We have users who participate throughout the week. And um, in between the release cycles, we have user meetups. We have operators who are uh, doing all sorts of things to help build the community. But I think that what's interesting is it's not just about what these people are doing inside of OpenStack. And you'll see these illustrations all over the event this week. All of these illustrations are actual OpenStack users and operators who, um, who you know, are, are doing real business on top of OpenStack today. And there are some different uh, signage and, and light booth areas where you can go and you can read about some of their stories. But what I think is, is really amazing is that in addition to what they're doing in OpenStack, in addition to you know, how they are embracing this agile infrastructure, they're really thinking at a higher, more strategic level, and they're changing their businesses. They're thinking about things in a different way. It's a different consumption model. And, and I love to see this. You know, it's no longer just passive consumption of software that you know, some vendor sells you on a, on a two or three year cycle. These users are getting involved, and they're helping to drive OpenStack. They're helping to change their businesses. And, uh, and they are really making a difference in the industries that they play in. And that's really exciting to see. We, uh, we have seen more and more of these users and operators participate in OpenStack. And so one of the things that we've wanted to focus on this year and at this event is, uh, is getting them more involved and, uh, and connecting them more and more. And when we were doing that, we wanted to, to think about some way to describe them, some way to talk about them. I used to run a lot of infrastructure. And uh, one of my coworkers, he used, to, uh, he used to say I was basically a plumber of the internet. <laughs> You know, it's a very vital job, but it's not necessarily glamorous. And, uh, and so we were thinking, you know, what, what is a, a good description of, uh, of, of these people? And what we have uh, started to call them are super users. The super user on a system is the administrative user with the highest level of access. And in many cases, you know, these OpenStack operators are people who are super users on their systems inside of their data centers. But I think the concept is bigger than that. Because if, if you look at what they're doing inside of their organizations, they are using their access, they're using their capabilities to bring about change and to make their organizations better and more competitive in the software-defined economy. And we've had some of these uh, users who have spoken with us before. Last year in uh, April, if you were at our event, you might have heard from Bloomberg, Praveer Chandra, who uh, spoke about the work that Bloomberg was doing. Um, Comcast came and did an awesome demo. In that time, Comcast has, uh, has gone from their initial deployment to being one of the top 20 contributing companies in Icehouse, which I think is really impressive. And it speaks to their commitment to, uh, to OpenStack. But you, know, you don't have to be a code contributor in order to be a super user, in order to have an impact. Um, when we were in Hong Kong, 
we heard from, uh, from a number of companies in, that are based in, in China and, and other places in Asia, including Eric Yi from C-Trip. And he talked about some of the changes that he was driving inside of his organization. In addition to applications, the traditional applications, he demoed a, a great um, mobile app for their, for their online booking software. Um, he talked about how they were using OpenStack to overhaul their desktop service inside of their help center with 16,000 agents. And, uh, and they were looking at cutting their costs in half. So that's a big change for his organization. And we have many, many more of these super users. They're here this week. I hope that you can find some and meet them and, uh, and get to know them. But I'm excited to have a couple who are here live and in person and who are going to be talking with us today and, uh, and telling us a little bit more about what they do. And in the past, we've done some kind of rapid fire um, presentations with these users. But today, what we're going to do is we're going to sit down and we're going to have a little bit more of a, of a conversation with, with a couple of users. So first of all, I'd like for you to help me welcome to the stage the head of private cloud enablement at Wells Fargo Bank, Glenn Ferguson. Love the music, Ben Horowitz would be proud of that. <laughs> I love Cool J. <clears throat> These shows have gotten so much more polished. I mean, did you see that? I walked over there and all of a sudden, bam, chairs on the stage. <laughs> so, Glenn, thank you for joining us. Yeah, glad to be here. Um, could you tell us a little bit about your background? I know you've been involved in, in infrastructure for, for quite a while. Sure, uh, you know, history repeats itself. It's kind of a, a common term. If I rewind 15 years ago, I was probably like a lot of the contributors here uh, in OpenStack except I worked for a small startup called Loud Cloud, um, where we were trying to automate operations. Uh, you know, at the time it was data center, storage, cooling, but we really had a, a different approach in how we wanted to automate operations. And to your point about the super user, being an engineer, we would sit down with our network operations staff and say, show us what you do. H how do you build machines? How do you monitor machines? How do you configure these machines? And it was our job to automate what they did. Um, 15 years ago, you know, VM, you know, virtual machines weren't as prevalent. They were kind of in a, a test dev mode. Um, and XML standards were kind of the open source of the day. You know, the big focus is on, we tried starting DCML, which is data center markup language, which was our version of open source, of trying to get everyone who played in the data center space a common way to describe infrastructure so we could perform, perform that level of integration. Um, so I picked up a lot of experience there, carried that through, I spent some time at Netflix, director of uh, cloud engineering, spent some time at HP Cloud Services. Um, and what really attracted me to HP Cloud Services was their adoption of OpenStack. It reminded me of the early years in, in Loud Cloud and Opsware and what we tried to accomplish. So um, you know, I've had quite a bit of experience in, in this industry, and I'm looking forward to you know, continue to be involved in it. Yeah, that's great. So you, know, you are a bank, <laughs> obviously. Yes, we are. You, you're working there. And um, why do you think that the financial services industry and you know, other organizations like yours are taking advantage of OpenStack? Yeah, well, I, you know, I think you touched upon it a lot in the, the presentation. Your infrastructure has to keep speed with software. Um, without that, um, you know, to your point, that the software isn't good. So there's nothing specific to the banks that a lot of other people aren't driving forward, except, I would say, compliance and risk. Um, you know, I'm a Facebook user, I use Twitter. For me, signing up is fairly simple. I give an email address, I give some voluntary information, uh, and then I'm on my way. When you look at uh, the financial institutions and what they do for the economy and the government as a whole, um, the know your customer, the amount of information we must collect, tying someone's financial instruments to a financial system, there's just a different amount of risk that's involved with that, a uh, different amount of focus. Uh, if you look at what's going on in the world today and, and you know, kind of what um, the president is doing with, with Russia and trying to put some sanctions on them, a lot of that is financial driven. Uh, so there's a lot of focus on compliance and, and risk mitigation in that environment. You know, so for those reasons, I think having control of kind of below the line and what we do below that cloud has an effect to ensure that we're always compliant, things are always backed up, uh, you know, they're, they're 
uh, securely stored, et cetera. So that might be the, the one difference from a financial services perspective. But you know, the, the other drivers, you know, why wouldn't you manage infrastructure this way, right? It's, it's, it's a better way of doing things. It's the consumerization of IT. Outside of work, these developers can use Amazon. They can use these public clouds. They're, they're much more efficient with it. But yet, when they come into this enterprise environment, they're just kind of bogged down and baffled as to why they can't get that same level of uh, efficiency. Right. Yeah, so there's still the desire for that same level of kind of control and, and flexibility. But how do, you, how do you balance that with the needs that you were talking about for compliance and the regulations? And, and where does OpenStack fit into bridging that divide? Yeah, OpenStack is, is a cornerstone. You know, I mentioned the line. And what I mean by the line is the API. Uh, above the line is where the developers are, are interacting and managing infrastructure through software and tools that they use today. But below that line is where the cloud operator plays. Uh, below the line is where you define your quality of service, your, your racks of hardware, targeting workloads. But that's also where we build in compliance. Um, we are fundamentally different than a public cloud provider. And, and I can say that because I've, I've played in both worlds. Um, you know, public cloud providers, I, I can give you a VM, and you're on your way. Here's route. Do what you need to do. In a highly uh, compliant environment, it's much more than that. It's patching, it's auditing, it's reporting, it's compliance. So using OpenStack below the line to enforce some of these you know, best practices and security is, is great for us. The developers work above the line. They're using web services. They're managing infrastructure through software. But yet below the line is where we build in and bake in the, the compliance that's needed in this environment. Right, OK. So um, how has OpenStack, you, know, you talk about above the line and below the line, how has it changed? your vendor interactions and how you, how you sort of um, have vendor relationships and drive those decisions about that technology below the line? We certainly let our vendors know that we are deploying OpenStack is, is um, kind of our cloud operating platform, for lack of a better term, um, and our desire you know, for these vendors to fully embrace and support that. Um, so I would say, you know, if I had to sum it up, that's probably the, the way that we engage our vendors is being upfront, letting them know where we're going, how we're using OpenStack, why we're using OpenStack, and that's the area that, that we want to drive forward. Right. Now, um, we, uh, we know that there are financial services organizations that are using OpenStack, but you are the, the first one to, to actually join us from a, uh, you know, a, a major bank and, and talk about um, what you're doing. Uh, why are you doing that? Why are you here today? I mean, I'm glad you are, but. <laughs> yeah, no, I, I, I'm glad. And I think it gets back to, to the previous question. You know, this is a community. Um, you know, I was hired by Wells to run a business and, and bring the best solution forward. And it's in my best interest uh, to be at these uh, conferences and let the community know that this is what we're using. Uh, put our use cases out there. Everything that happens in parallel with Wells, For with Wells Fargo could happen in parallel with many other engagements and companies. So it's the collective mass of the community that everyone benefits from. You know, I'm not a developer anymore. I couldn't have stood up earlier when you know contributed to Ice House or anything. So this is my my form of contribution. Um, you know, letting the community know this is very valuable. Um, letting the community know what our use cases are, and you know, we're trying to run a serious business on this technology. So that's the primary reason that I'm here. So my last question, um, as, you know, as we look at this shift that's happening in the industry, do you feel like inside of Wells Fargo, the infrastructure, the back-end systems, you know, this um, technology stack that we're talking about is really becoming something that, that has strategic value to the larger organization? Uh, most definitely. Uh, the agility, the, the speed, really allowing the developers to modify that software in lockstep with the infrastructure, speed to market, we have competitors. You know, we're a large bank. We have targets on our back. There's disruption happening everywhere. We're doing our best to stay competitive on all levels. And this is certainly, you know, technology is a key component of, of any business, certainly financial services. Um, so this is something we have to do to remain competitive and be flexible and agile in this environment. Great. Well, thank you very much, Glenn, for, uh, for joining us. All right, thank you. Appreciate it. It's good to talk. Thanks, everyone. We have a, another user that, uh, that is here to speak with us today. And uh, he, he comes from a company that has one of the probably most beloved brands of, of all time, the Walt Disney Company. Please help me welcome the Director of Cloud Services and Architecture for Walt Disney Company, Chris Lonnie.
Chris, thank you for, uh, for being here with us. Could you tell us a little bit about what you're, what you're doing at Walt Disney Company? Sure. I, uh, I, I normally actually tell a story in response to that question, but I'll, I'll give you the quick version. <laughs> you can go home and go to WordPress and register and build out a little website. You can go register DNS, uh, you know, license art, buy some plugins. You can spend 20 minutes with a credit card and have a completely set up web presence. You can go to work and you can submit tickets and fill out process exception request forms and get your boss to send and you know, respond to an email and click something and you can wait and wait and wait. As an entire industry of technologists, we have spent a long time empowering people much better when they go home than when they come to work with their technology. And what I've been trying to do is change that. Inside of Disney, outside of Disney, uh, you know, I'm, I'm like many others, I'm sure, in the audience are trying to lead a revolution to, to help empower people when they come to work with technology. Yeah. So we've talked a few times, and, uh, and you said something that was kind of funny, and I actually made a couple of slides here. <laughs> you said, you know, everybody's familiar with this triangle. Has everybody seen this before? You know, you have the triangle, it's good, fast, cheap, and you get to pick two. And what you said is that that triangle now looks like this. It's just fast, fast, fast. <laughs> it, it, it's funny. If you look at what any business needs these days, if you're dealing at all with information, you need speed. That's what everybody craves. It's, if you give somebody enough fast, they can make their own cheap. They can get their product to market quickly. They can respond to market demands and changes. They can be the first candy game on Facebook instead of the second candy-related game on Facebook. Uh, you know, you can, uh, you know, you, you can deal, you can make your own cheap by just increasing your revenue by just getting to market more quickly and, and being able to work faster. You can make your own good by shrinking your dev cycles. You can change things all the time by only changing little bits at each time. Move to more continuous integration, continuous delivery models. So pro product quality goes up. So if you just give somebody the faster lover's pizza with an extra helping of faster on top of it, they'll go make their own good and their own cheap. <laughs> yeah, I love that. Faster lover's pizza with an extra helping of faster. Um, that's one of, one of my favorite uh, descriptions of it. <laughs> so, you know, you're, you're talking earlier, you were talking a lot about, um, you know, how it shouldn't be easier for them to be more productive at home than at work. You know, you're talking about lowering barriers. And it actually reminds me of, an interaction I had one time, this is you know, a few years back when uh, I was at the Rackspace Cloud and I had gone and spoken at a conference and um, very large corporation, uh, one of their, their IT leaders walked up to me afterwards and, and he said, said, you're creating problems for me. And I said, sorry, you know, what, what's going on? And, <laughs> and he said, um, my developers inside of my company are going and signing up with your service and putting workloads on, on your your services, and uh, I need you to, to stop letting them do that. Yeah. And I was, I was like, well, how would you like me to do that? And he said, well, I don't know, blacklist, you know, xcompany.com email addresses from being able to sign up. Right. And I was like, but they'll just use a personal one. And he's like, well, you know, blacklist IP blocks. And, and I said, well, I mean, it seems like they're looking for something, and maybe that's what, you know, like the conversation we should have is figure out, like, how can you deliver what they're looking for through a way that meets your requirements. Yeah, absolutely. The, the, uh, you hear, anytime you get technology people together, there's this discussion of shadow IT and how it's a bad thing and you need to you know, shine the light into the corners and eliminate it. And that's crazy. It's, it's, uh, it's like the little tablets that you chewed when you went to the dentist at age eight that showed you where you weren't brushing properly. Shadow IT is awesome because it shows you <laughs> where your opportunities are, right? Where, where, you're not, where your service is not market competitive. Where are they not compelling? How are you not enabling people to do their jobs? You know, we, we hire amazing, passionate, driven people and then we put mountains of obstacle course and process in front of them, and we shouldn't do that. You know, and I, I don't mean we, because you know, we're, uh, we're trying to fix that, but everybody should try to fix that. That's... Yeah. yeah, it seems like there's a lot of stick out there. <laughs> yes. Yeah, exactly. In the IT world, and, and uh, you know, if we change that more to carrot, if we change that more to, to enablement, then, uh, then we end up with a, with a, uh, a I think, you know, a more empowered set of technologists. Sure. So, um, you know, I had the uh, slide up earlier of, of the sponsors that are here, and you know, that's a, a, a portion of the, the ecosystem that participates in OpenStack. And one thing that, that you know, um, I've heard before is people, uh, they, they look at OpenStack and they, they are 
concerned about how they're going to get started in OpenStack, how they're going to make use of it, because it's a, it's a big set of technologies. But there are a lot of people out there who are able to, uh, to, to help you do that. And, and I, I know that you have an interesting story about that as well. I mean, what, what has your experience been with kind of working with OpenStack and the vendor ecosystem? Um, yeah, I, uh, I, was our, I was our virtualization snake oil guy, too, back in 2007. And you know, we, we had worked with the, our hypervisor for a, about six months before we felt confident enough to put our first production file server on it. Right? And when we deployed OpenStack, we didn't have the time to do that. Right? It was, it was, you know, the whole point is, let's go fast. So uh, we engaged a company called MetaCloud that we've been working with and, and had great success with. Uh, they, they take OpenStack, they add to it. You know, th there's, some, uh, there's some things that aren't finished yet. They help, they contribute back you know, to the project. And uh, then they'll deploy and run it for you in your data center. So it, it gave us a very quick, we went from month one looking at technologies, month two POC, month three deployed. At the very end of that month, it was we launched a pilot uh, and, and ran a pilot of, wow. of OpenStack as infrastructure as a service. Yeah. So it's, it, yeah, it, you can go very quick. Uh, and you don't have to staff up a whole big department of people to, uh, to do the operations and all that kind of stuff for you. So it's, it's, a, it's a nice model, because if the whole point is speed, right, and trying to deliver that to people, you want to operate in that same agile model yourself. Right. OK. Last question. I want to ask you the same thing that I, that I asked Glenn. Um, you know, when you, when you look at, uh, at this infrastructure and the way that, that your business is moving, the trajectory that it's on, does it feel to you like, like those back-end systems and those servers and storage systems and everything, you know, all of that stuff that's, that used to just be in a closet somewhere is becoming more strategic and more recognized within your organization as, as providing value. I, I think there's, there's not anybody who works with any sort of digital information that doesn't uh, understand that it's important, all that stuff. I also don't know anybody who works with those things who wants to care about all that stuff, <laughs> right? So uh, you know, it's it's becoming really important, but it, it also isn't something that people want to spend time, you know, worrying about, right? It's it's uh, it's more like the dial tone where it just has to be there and has to work, but you don't, you know, oh, thank goodness the dial tone is still on, right? When you pick up your <laughs> phone, that's an outmoded example because I don't I haven't, I don't, haven't heard a dial tone in probably nine months, but uh, <laughs> but yeah, it's uh, yeah, so. Yes, it's, it's obviously of strategic value, but uh, it's also something that you want to provide as a utility service, right? Where when you plug something in, it just works and goes. Yep. Okay. Well, great. Well, thank you again for joining us, and, uh, and we're well, happy to have you here at the show this week. Thanks a lot. So, um, I'm glad we had Glenn and, and Chris join us. And uh, we have many, many other users that are here. If you are looking at getting involved in OpenStack and want to speak with them, um, please you know, track some down and, and find out about their experiences. It's, it's a really great community to be part of. Uh, I'm actually going to take a little break now. And we're going to have a couple of our headline sponsors who are, are going to come up here and speak. I'm going to be back in a little bit, and I have uh, some announcements that, uh, that I'm going to be making about some new initiatives that the foundation is launching this year. So, so stick around for those. One of the things that we did before the event this time is we, um, we actually got a number of, uh, of these super users to sit down with us and, uh, and talk about their experiences on video. And uh, we're going to be playing these videos throughout the general session this morning, as well as, uh, as, well as tomorrow. And so um, I want to go ahead and, and play this first one where we, are, where we hear super users talk about the advantages that they see with, uh, with OpenStack. The primary impact of, of being part of and leveraging the OpenStack community is the reason we did it in the first place, which is velocity of our application development. Um, we are delivering new features, new products, far faster than we ever have done before. We have hard deadlines, we have hard air dates for TV shows, so you know, being able to, to shift and adapt that compute infrastructure, that storage infrastructure, that networking infrastructure, um, was was a tremendous advantage. 
One of the advantages that kind of OpenStack allows us is for our developers to kind of iterate faster and be able to get better products out to our customers uh, quicker. And that really, that speed um, and agility is something that we find very important. We're in a highly volatile, highly competitive business. And I know everyone says that about their business, but, but you're dealing with shows that only last for six months and you have to design a custom workflow for that show. So having an infrastructure that can change is means that we became more profitable as a business. And um, hopefully the quality of life of our employees also went up as a result of that as well. It's pretty key to what we're doing, both internally and externally, um, and we're deploying our entire platform directly to OpenStack, sort of all at once. Um, so we're able to stand up um, an entire platform environment just with like one command. I think the, uh, the big impact for Bloomberg in, in using OpenStack and looking to the future is going to be in how we're actually going to be able to expand the services that we deliver to our customers by using OpenStack infrastructure. Uh, again, through the agility and the, and the, uh, the flexibility that it gives you, it actually allows us to start delivering new things to our customers. With OpenStack, we've uh, uh, deployed um, uh, several OpenStack clusters which we're making available to internal developers to uh, work on their new ideas and uh, also in production to push out those ideas you know, from the development side into the production side um, with sort of minimal amount of fuss and energy. OpenStack has given me a future that three or four years ago I didn't think was going to exist. So I love hearing stories from our, from our users and, and operators. And Guillaume, who you saw there at the end of the video, he's actually uh, going to be here speaking um, on stage tomorrow morning. So come back, and you can, uh, you can hear some more from him.